Okay, so um, yes, what did I want to say? So um, right. Um, so what what we want to uh, generalize is sort of the, the curvature assumption. So there have been previous gen uh, generalizations uh, by Peterson and uh, Day and uh, Ray. Uh, where you actually assume instead of an L-infinity bound, an LP bound on the curvature where P is more than N over 2, which is sort of the critical value. But that's not quite what we are interested in. We want kind of an L1 bound, but at the same time, we allow ourselves uh, a uniform lower curvature bound, right? So we sort of have, from below, we have a uniform bound, but otherwise we want to deal with L1 bound. So that's, uh, that's kind of... Uh, yeah, I probably don't have time to explain why we are interested in this. Um, okay, so let me first state the results, or maybe afterwards I do have time. Okay, so theorem. Uh, so now it's a little bit more complicated. So we have to give ourselves a dimension and a diameter bound, and then there exists the epsilon and d, which is positive such that we have a compact manifold, so M is closed. Curvature is larger than minus one, and diameter less than D. So that's, so far this is any manifold after scaling, if you make D big enough, uh, you can satisfy this, right? Um, and then, but then, as I said, we want a L1 bound on the, on the curvature, right? So, so the norm of the curvature operator, you could also say the norm of the absolute value of the curvature, make a difference, equivalent. Um, is uh, less or equal than epsilon nd. And so this stands for uh, one over volume of n. So we divide by the volume. Um, so it's an averaged integral, right? So an average, the L1 norm is, is, is small, right? So, um, that's, so then the conclusion is the same. So then I'm sorry, Is it actually a cranial? I think so. Yes, so we are, yeah, we are pretty sure, but maybe not quite, yeah. So it's a, it's a cipher bundle over, uh, over a flat Warby Ford, uh, and, uh, and the, the fibers are in front here, uh, the generic fibers, so it's a, uh, yeah. I, uh, I think it's maybe and, uh, yeah, so that's maybe enough uh, to conclude that it is diffeomorphic. Uh, but uh, right, so far we haven't uh, we haven't really worried so much about this. Okay, so the conclusion is essentially the yeah it is the same as from a theorem. It's only that the assumptions are slightly weaker. Um, right. Yes, so I should maybe say a uh, remark. So, um, if we assume instead so, sort of richly larger than n minus 1, uh, the conclusion is false. Right? So, conclusion. and dimensions larger than equal to four. four. Um, so the, the counter examples would be uh, a K3 surface, so K3 surface uh, with a sequence of Einstein metrics, a uh, Ricci flat metric. Converging to, uh, so that's a four-dimensional Ricci flat manifold, and it sort of has a the modal space of Ricci flat metrics is quite big. 
so you can mess around with them. And uh, so this has a sequence of metrics converging to a four torus divided by plus minus identity. So it converges to an orbifold, four dimensional orbifold. Um, and so then, uh, apart, so away from the singularities, this, uh, this conversion is going to be smooth, right? So uh, there, the L1 bound actually does go to zero. But by gauss bonnet formula, actually, you do have an L2 bound for the curvature. That, so that means the L1 bound actually has to go to zero uh, on, on, on the, in this situation, right? So this, is, this can not be true with the Ricci curvature bound. It's still an interesting question what happens in, with the Ricci curvature. If you only have a Ricci curvature bound, sort of what kind of manifolds will show up, right? So I think even the non collapse case in this case is, is very. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. All right, so um, yes, uh, then okay. So I mean, one okay. So maybe I just say it in, in words. So one reason why we are interested in it is sort of that we uh, would like to understand uh, uh, a question related to a question of John Love, right? So. Uh, if you have a, a manifold of almost no negative sectional curvature, um, so when does it admit a metric of positive scalar curvature, right? So the, the result should be, it either admits a metric of positive scalar curvature or uh, the manifold is actually infranear. So that's sort of what we, uh, what we think uh, it should, how it should be, right? So, um, and this is, this is sort of part of the way, um, right? It's, it's not all the way. Uh, it's not so clear why it's related to this. Uh, okay, so, um, yes, so let me try to uh, talk a little bit about the, about the proof. Um, right, so we, this, right, so the, I, I should also say the concept is not effective, right, so we argue by contradiction, proof. Um, so suppose we have a sequence of manifolds uh, satisfying uh, yeah. put it again, so curvature larger than minus one, a diameter less than D. And and integral over the normal curvature of operator uh, less than uh, one over two to the i. Uh, so, and the conclusion is false, right? So, also. and m is not in front. <coughs> get a contradiction. All right, so, um, yeah, so the argument is, is very indirect, and, uh, and it, it is pretty, uh, pretty involved. In particular, the, the uh, collapse case is pretty involved, uh, but uh, maybe it can give you an idea how you can get the non-collapse case today. All right, so, um, so one can first use uh, Gromov's pre-compactness result. So, Mi, Gi, after passing through subsequence, right? So, so the good thing about a contradicting sequence is always you can pass through subsequence and you still have a contradiction, right? So with it's no loss of generality that this will converge to some space x uh, with some distance function. So to metric space in the Gromov Hausdorff sense. All right, so this just means that you have a map from, from here to there, which 
preserves distances up to an additive error, epsilon i, which goes to zero. And you also have to map in the other way, which also preserves distance up to this additive error, epsilon i, which goes to zero. And uh, the combination of these two maps, if you combine them either way, they are equal to the identity up to an error, epsilon i. Uh, and uh, so that's what Kromer force of convergence means. Right, so, um, yes, so, uh, so the, the, right, so the, 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 the proof is then, the proof, I mean, the proof is getting a contradiction, right, so the proof is by inverse induction. Induction on the dimension of x. Right, so you need to generalize the statement a little bit so to allow that the diameter goes to infinity, but that, that all makes sense, and then you want to prove it by inverse induction on x. Uh, but today uh, I'm only talking about the, the induction base, uh, which is that the dimension of x is equal to n. So induction base So in that case, what, what we have to show is that X is actually a, a flat manifold. So we have to prove <coughs> X is a flat manifold. And why will that contradict the conclusion you want? Yeah. And that's right. So X is a flat manifold. I mean, then in particular, it's, 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 it's smooth, right? So usually you would expect singularities in the limit. Um, so if the, lim if the limit is smooth, then actually the manifolds are actually diffeomorphic uh, to the limit for all but finitely many i. And so then uh, X is, by the people of theorem, finitely covered by, by a torus. Right. Okay, so, so how are we? Going to show that this is uh, flat. Right. So, um, well, the 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 main step is is the is to show that. If you have a generic point in X, that it has a flat neighborhood. Right, so it means that we first talk about this, then we worry about the Peterson's later. So suppose P is an X and it's called generic, right? So that means there's something like a tangent cone and it's isometric to Rn. Right, okay, so X is a so called Alexandrov space because we have a lower curvature bound that carries over to the limit. Uh, so you have structure theory uh, by various people, uh, Anton, Perlman, and, and right, so you, you know that uh, most for, for a set of full measure, you actually know that uh, the tension cone is going to be Euclidean, right? It's always the same dimension. All right, so, um, so then the, 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 what we want to, want to prove here is uh, there's a, there exists epsilon positive such that P, the ball of radius epsilon around P is a flat length. All right, so that's, that's already pretty strong. Strong statement once you have that. Okay, so um, right, so we choose in, in our manifold a sequence to prove this. We choose in the manifold a sequence pi and m with pi converges to converges to p. So 
So that just means that somehow uh, in the grammar cost of convergence, we have chosen our maps, which go from here to there. So if we have a sequence pi, we can choose, move it with a map to x, and then uh, the image actually converges to p, right? So that's sort of a, a, the usual notation of convention that we use. All right, so, uh, and then there's the first thing, uh, which is well known actually, uh, sub-step on sub -step one, uh, there exists a uh, epsilon positive such that um, and that well, and the L positive Radius epsilon around pi is L by Lipschitz for a subset in Euclidean space. So. Uh, is L by Lipschitz. <coughs> and its image. If you want that the map is smooth. Okay, so this is this is not very difficult. Um, you you basically use distance functions, so you kind of use a coordinate system uh, such that uh, you move a point to uh, q1, q distance q n q. Okay, right. Um, I should probably suppress the. This, of course, also depends on i. Um, and so now, um, so you, I claim there's sort of such a coordinate system, and how do you need to choose these points q, uh, q i, right? So q q one i, q j i converges to q j, and the limit. And it looks in the limit a little bit like, like this, right? So you have your point P, and then uh, your point QI, uh, Q, QJ. Q, Q2, and they, so the geodesics between them almost form, uh, form an orthonormal basis, right? If you do this correctly and you, you make the distances between Q1 and Q2 not, not too big, uh, then you kind of have also antipodal points, so you have points which almost go in the opposite, opposite direction, right, so that's uh, Q2 minus. I mean, the geodesic doesn't really go through P, but uh, the geodesic here from an angle close to pi. And then you can make sure that you have this uh, Lipschitz constant. So this is not. Uh, Are you using the geometric hypothesis on the MI at this point? Uh, In this no, uh, right. So just a lower curvature bound. So this is just just true if you have a lower curvature bound, right? So um, yeah, that's that's actually the only place where the lower curvature bound enters in, in this 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 step. That you have a uniform lower lower bound. Otherwise, we actually use. More the integral part, right? So um, yeah, I do use that uh, that the, the point P at X is, is regular, right? That means if, if this is all very close to uh, close to, to one, then this we we pretty much know that this looks like Euclidean space, right? So so in Euclidean space you can clearly do this, and uh, so if you zoom in here very, very closely, then the space looks looks like Euclidean space, and that's why you can do this here too. And then you just use these as coordinate system in your limit space, and you can transfer them to, to x, right? So that's sort of a well-known uh, well trick how to, to use this. Okay. Um, so now, uh, what does that help? Um, so, right, so this is actually not a smooth coordinate system, but you can use uh, average distance function, for example, um, by, 
by not taking the distance to, to a point, but the distance to a small, small delta ball around, around the point. Uh, and this, then you get a, a C1 coordinate system. And then you can have, well, actually, yeah, a C2 coordinate system. Okay, so we can basically think of, uh, so now we think of, of B epsilon around PI as, as a Euclidean, as a Euclidean ball, so ball in Euclidean space uh, with some metric. So DI is now just a metric in, in Euclidean space. So we, we actually use our coordinates now. Right, so, and the only thing we, we're going to need about GI is, is that it is bounded, right? So GI is less than uh, L times the Euclidean metric and larger or equal than 1 over L times the Euclidean metric. Okay, and otherwise we, 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 we stick to our integral bounds, right? So we want to show that the limit, the grammar of Hausdorff limit is, is, is flat. Okay, so then uh, step two is why? So there exists uh, an x1 to xn uh, pointwise orthonormal, so vector fields on e epsilon zero, and they also depend on i. Point by source normal. Uh, such that um, as the following, so um, we integrate of the epsilon of zero um, and we take the derivative of these vectors. This what new, new, what does new mean? Uh, it's a vector field. So vector fields. This just means we, we have vector fields. Oh, vector. Oh, thank you. Yes. So we want to... They are, they are pointwise also normal with respect to the Riemannian metric and not the Euclidean metric. Uh, and the derivative, and that's also the derivative with respect to the Riemannian metric, uh, Uh, okay, right, and it doesn't really matter whether you integrate with respect to the Riemann metric or the Euclidean metric because they are equivalent to measures, so this should go to, to zero. <clears throat> so you kind of construct a framing which is, is almost parallel. Goes to zero with i. Uh, yes, as i goes to infinity. Right, yes. So you can construct a, a parallelization which is sort of almost parallel in the, in the L1 sense, right? Okay, so uh, how do you do that? Right, so that's a, essentially it's by radial parallel transport. Um, okay, so, um, but you need to choose your base point. Uh, good, right, so. Uh, so there exists a point claim. Uh, there exists a point Qi is the ball of radius epsilon ten around zero, uh, such that following all so take the integral over uh, the ball radius epsilon zero, take the norm of the curvature operator and divide by uh, q i minus q to the n minus two. So this goes to zero. So 
So we can uh, we can sort of put a weight function if we choose our our a point a little bit smart, then we can put a put a weight function which goes to infinity as we approach the the base point. All right, and this is very very easy. I mean, you just integrate it out, right? So you just shoot, integrate over the power of radius epsilon over ten around zero. Uh, and this is now with respect, the second integration is with respect to d u q i, and then this dependence will, will just cancel out because this is very well integrable, right? So this is actually uh, pretty clear that you actually have such a point, so, right? So then there must be one uh, integral where this goes to, goes to zero, right? So you can actually choose this point. And uh, to simplify life, we can assume without loss of generality, qi simply to zero. Uh, so that <coughs> make much of a difference. Okay, so uh, now we have have the slightly improved curvature bound, and now the, the vector fields are just going to be obtained by radial parallel transport, right? So you choose an orthonormal basis at zero. And then you parallel transport it radially to anywhere else. And red, so and the only w w point where where uh, the Euclidean metric enters is in the word of the, of the is in the word radial, right? So you use it, your Euclidean coordinate system to uh, to uh, to define what radial means, radial away from zero, right? So you don't use geodesic here because you don't have an injectivity radius estimate or anything, right? But otherwise, um, uh, everything else is with respect to uh, the Riemann metric, right? So you use a normal basis at zero and radial parallel transported along, uh, along these curves, right? So x1 of zero. X and I so uh, also on the basis and then gradually parallel transported. To uh, Okay, um, right, so, I mean, then, uh, so why, why do you expect that this will, uh, so that this estimate then will imply this estimate, right? So basically, you can think about this as, you can look at these small, small triangles, right? So you actually look at essentially an infinitesimal small triangle like this, right? So where where the lines here are radial with respect to the Euclidean metric, and this is this is also just a straight line with respect to the Euclidean metric, right? So uh, the, the vector fields are parallel along here and along here, right? So the derivative of the vector field in first order sort of determines what the holonomy is of this uh, this small triangle. And then there's, on the other hand, a well-known estimate that you can estimate the holonomy of a triangle by integrating the curvature over, over the surface, right? So then you have to integrate the curvature of the surface, and then uh, if you carry this out, then you basically see that this integral here is, is equivalent uh, up to a constant to this integral, right? So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the end of it, uh, well, for, of this step. This Okay, so now, um, so what do these vector fields help you? It's a little bit indirect after this still. Um, so now you look actually at, at the flow of these vector fields, right? So um, consider step three. Uh, the flow. of uh, pi i j of 
x i j converges uh, to an isomorphism. So this is only the flow is only locally defined, and so the, the isometry is also only locally defined. But this is not so big an issue, right? Um, okay, so I didn't say in which sense, right? So it's it's only in a in a weakly measured sense, right? So you kind of uh, what that means is uh, what what's the weakly measured convergence? The convergence, right? So you have convergence only in a weakly measured sense. So, so in a, yeah. Uh, in a weakly measured sense, and, and what that means is uh, <clears throat> you kind of throw away uh, a portion of the volume of the ball of radius epsilon around zero, but the portion that you're allowed to throw away goes to zero as i goes to infinity, and after that, uh, the, so if you restrict the map to, to the complement of the small portion, uh, it's close to an isometry in the limit. Right? So that's, that's what that means. Right? And so this is just a simple calculation. You just look at, uh, you compute. So you look at the ball of radius epsilon across the ball of radius epsilon around zero um, and uh, compute the distance distortion, phi t of p, <coughs> it of q, uh, minus the distance p and q, and uh, absolute value of that. And uh, you want to show that this integral actually goes to zero. Right? So that in some, uh, one sense, this, uh, this, uh, this law preserves distances. And this you can just do by, uh, by, taking, by taking the derivative, basically. Right, so there's well, right there's a small issue because it's not measure preserving, but you can get get around it. Um, right, so that's uh, that's basically uh, the idea. Right, so you show that this actually goes to zero, and once you know that this goes to zero, it's automatic that uh, this converges to an isometry. Okay. Um, right. So now. Um, you know that the limit is, is, is locally homogeneous, so, um, with it, well, you need to work a little bit, but somehow you, you actually know that the limit is, is locally homogeneous, uh, because you have all these isometries, right, from these different vector fields, and since they are also normal, it's not so hard to see that somehow the, <coughs> the limit action is going to be transitive, so um, the epsilon. The epsilon of zero is locally homogeneous. So that means you actually have a G infinity, you actually have a smooth limit matter. Right. There's, a, there's a smooth limit matter. So the whole Procedure here was essentially only to show that the limit is, 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 is going to be smooth. Once you know that the limit is smooth, you can actually uh, use a sort of a different argument. I mean, you do have some bounds on, on the derivatives of your. And if you look at the matrix in your local coordinates, you do have uh, L2 bounds on the. On the uh, uh, or, no, L1 bounds on the. Uh, derivatives uh, of the metric, right? So you can actually you can actually pass to a limit metric already, right? So in, in, in L1, so this converges in L1. Uh, and then uh, you can actually, once you know that the limit metric is smooth, you can actually pr improve this convergence to all the way to uh, C infinity, right? So this actually converges in C0 to a limit metric. And uh, and then you also know that the vector fields, or the vector fields, you also have bounds on the derivatives in, in the L1 sense, right? So the vector fields converge, uh, xji converge to x infinity i, uh, 
first only at one cent, but then you you can you can uh, you can show that the, the limit is the superscript. Right? Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, J infinity, right? Uh, so and these are parallel, right? So then you can actually show that eventually these things are a parallel once you sort of have improved your your convergence. And okay, so that this shows then that the, that the limit is is, is smooth. Uh, okay, right. This was not quite the, the whole thing of the non-collapse case. Um, you say that your, your grade from L1 converges to C infinity convergence. So C0. No, 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 not C infinity, C0. Right. Uh, uh, C0. C, uh, so you, you, this converge. You can then show that this actually converges uh, in C0 sense to a limit, right? So. Uh, one, uh, yeah, this only works because you kind of know that the limit is smooth, so you actually do have an injectivity radius in the limit. That's that's important. Otherwise, you cannot uh, get it. Um, right, and then you can basically you you essentially, uh, I mean, you you have your bounds on the on the on the derivative of these vector fields, and you kind of use uh, partial integration sort of to transfer it with some test test vector field uh, to. Uh, to the other side, and then use con using consoles formula, and then you can show that uh, the limit vector fields are going to be parallel. Right. Okay. So um, yeah. Right. Here also, you in this argument, you also use that the limit vector fields are are going to be smooth because there are the killing vector fields of these um, of these uh, flows. Okay. Um, yeah. So then, uh, if if P is P is, a, P is a singular point, so CP, CP axis is not uh, uh, RN, right? So let's rule out this case. So essentially, uh, one can reduce it to the case that um, CP. The main case one has to rule out is actually uh, substep again. It's not uh, isometric to Rn minus two uh, cross a call, two-dimensional call. So once once you have that, then you already know that your manifold is flat outside uh, co outside co-dimension three, uh, co dimension three, and uh, then things follow from from parallel stability theorem, right? So you know that the limit. Is actually a, a topologically a manifold. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah. So this uh, maybe I'll, I'll make it short, right? So you, you, if, if, the, if the cone is very very large, you can do essentially the same argument as before, right? So if there's a counterexample, there's a maximal counterexample, and uh, and then uh, basically you just. Uh, Zoom in a little bit further, right? So basically, you you show that uh, if there's a counterexample, um, there's a maximal one, and then you you find a you rescale your sequence of manifolds so that uh, the the limit is close to to this, uh, but not uh, equal to this, uh, and then you you find an, a non-flat counterexample which doesn't have any co-dimension two singularities, but is is not flat, and that's then the contradiction. Okay, so that was a little short, but I think I'm out of time. Uh, so, any questions? So, I have a question. So, what about a lower curvature bound? Is it possible to replace the lower curvature bound by some integral bound? Um, well, I mean, you could try to replace it by, by some integral LP bound, right? But I mean, yeah, so it's, it's certainly not, uh, uh, yeah, certainly not an L1 bound, right? So as I say, so you cannot replace it by a Ricci curvature bound, right? So if you, yeah, in principle, you could replace it by LP bound, maybe by with P larger than N over 2, but I haven't, but not I, I didn't think, but think about not N over 2. Huh? But not N over 2 exactly. Uh, not uh, okay. The quality? No, I don't know. Right? No, I, I never. No, I, I didn't give it any thought. Um.
And now another question. So wh why it was important to have this bound L1 bound for curvature for, for, the, pur for the purposes of answering log question? Where exactly? So if you're interested in uh, non almost non negative curve manifold, so where, where exactly this L1 bound? Right, so I mean, uh, you can, for example, look at the problem uh, of deforming a metric. Uh, uh, is it, you can ask yourself is the question is the metric conformally equivalent to a metric of positive scalar curvature, right? So that corresponds to uh, uh, the question whether the operator u goes to minus one plus u plus scalar curvature times u uh, has, a, has a positive first eigenvalue, right? So then you look at for example, the eigenfunction to the so you assume that the lowest eigenvalue is actually negative, right? So that the scalar, if you have almost no negative curvature, then you know that this here is actually already well, it can be negative, but not much, right? So then you look at this eigenfunction and you you integrate this scalar product with u and you do partial integration, then you see that this here, number u squared plus scalar curvature times u squared. Um, uh, this is negative. Right, so, uh, and this is basically, uh, yeah, I mean, this, this is not, cannot be very negative because the scalar curvature is almost non negative, right? This is definitely positive. Um, so, this is sort of a weighted version of, of what we have had before, and it's sort of exactly at the critical level, right? So you, you basically kind of know things outside co-dimension two, but you can't quite make it to co-dimension two with, with this approach. Um, so this doesn't quite, uh, quite work, right? So, um, uh, so what one probably needs to, to do it slightly differently, I think, uh, maybe using, uh, uh, yeah, using directly the rack operators, uh, right? So. The other question. So thank you again.